Awesome. So thank you, Sandy, and thank you, everyone who's participating live in this webinar. Uh, so yeah, we'll do a, a few housekeeping things before we get into the presentation. The, the first thing is the questions. Um, that, that's that's a, a great point. So if you do have some questions and I don't, there's a good chance that I may answer the question um, very shortly after. So what I would suggest doing is, is typing them in, in the chat box or, or writing them down uh, at your whatever office you're, you're watching this at. And then at the very end, we can kind of go through, we can keep track of those questions in the, in the chat box and, and try to answer them. Uh, I might see one pop up, but rather than stop the presentation and answer the question, because I have a lot to get through, I'll probably just keep going and we'll try to answer those, those questions at the end. Uh, so that being said, we have an hour to do this in, uh, but just to warn you, this, it's definitely going to go over an hour. Uh, I, there's a lot of information to cover, and it's 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 really difficult to try to fit it all in uh, to to one hour. Um, so we'll do our best. But remember, if if you need to get off the call. The, this presentation is actually being recorded right now. So both Sandy and I will have it posted on two different respective YouTube pages and we'll, we'll definitely get you the link for that so you can watch this later if you have to go or you, you have any audio issues and you cut out, you can come back and, and revisit that. So, so Sandy just said uh, she will be able to help answer some of your questions. And I also see that Lori George is on the call. And Lori can probably help answer your questions as well. So that'll be a good segue into the presentation because uh, Lori and I are actually the two, well, two of three lead trainers for the Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Rule Training in Illinois. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is it, we're borrowing even some of the information from that, that same training that we're do, we're, we do with larger growers, larger commercial growers, even larger urban farmers. And we're, I'm going to scale that down a little bit and apply it to... Uh, the donation garden project that we're all involved with. So you can kind of think of it as, as small scale, good, good agricultural practices. So some of it will be uh, very relevant uh, to even the larger farms, but we'll take some of, we'll try to make it apply and be more applicable to th this, this smaller scale uh, that we're working with here. So, so that being said, we'll, we'll kind of go ahead and, and get into this. So the first thing I'll, I'll talk about is the fact that I am actually participating in this in this GIFA project as well. So we have uh, the Dalton Food Pantry Demonstration Garden up here in Cook County. So here are two two images of it that you see here the, that we we've, we've invested a little bit of money in uh, this past year, and we haven't even we haven't used the site yet, but we're using some of our funds to uh, get this site up and running and to apply some of the actually some of the practices and SOPs that we're going to discuss today. We're going to put those in play at our garden. Garden here. So, so that being said, um, I will actually probably be doing a series of vlogs and videos related not only to how we're setting our demonstration garden up, but but also how we're applying some of these food safety practices to the garden. So I, I actually have a vlog that isn't that well known yet. It's called the Urban Egg Connect vlog, and I can I can send the link to to you guys uh, out in the field so you can keep track of that. And I'll I'll definitely as I make videos throughout the season, I'll make sure to post those on there so you guys can watch it and kind of see our demonstration garden grow, um, not only for our growing practices but also how we're applying some of these food safety principles. So so I'm in this with you guys, and I'm not just here to to, to speak down and say this is what you should be doing. I'm going to be applying these practices in our demonstration garden as well. So in terms of the steps that we're going to try to go through um, for safe growing and harvesting practices, we're going to we're going to try to step through this in a few different ways. We're going to we're going to first start about uh, start with looking at the different risks, trying to identify risks, do what we call uh, for our larger growers a, a basic risk assessment of, of your garden site. And, you know, this could be a, a very small step or it could be a large step depending on how uh, involved you want to get into it. And part of identifying risks, once you do identify potential risks, you can also begin to put in place uh, both preventative and corrective actions depending on if you have your garden site already set up or you're you're taking um, you're actually going to be setting uh, your donation garden up this year for the very first time so you can think about that both ways but it's really critical to start with identifying the risks and then ranking the risks in terms of 
what are some things in your donation garden that are very, very risky that you might want to um, deal with first before moving on to some of the things that you know are going to take multiple years to fix or might be too expensive for you to fix. And some of those things will become obvious uh, as, we, as we move through this. The other thing we're going to discuss and I want you to think about as we move through these different practices are SOPs, so standard operating procedures. I have a slide coming up. We're going to dive into that a little bit more. But thinking about developing practices and policies that you have as garden leaders, coordinators, or working with other volunteers in the garden that you can put in place to help make safe growing and harvesting practices just the culture of the donation garden and, and make it less of an issue and have less conflict and, and be and it'll allow you to be more tactful about um, putting in corrective measures if you see someone doing something wrong or, or you see something wrong at the site. So developing these ahead of time, so this time of year, uh, before you're going to start growing or harvesting is the best time to do it. So we're going to look at some different SOPs that you could put in place, and we're going to be looking at a lot of just general gap practices for uh, the small-scale donation garden. So part of this, so you are going through uh, the training right now, and you're going to be able to look at some of the equipment and maybe small facilities that you might want to put in place or small scale infrastructure that you put in place to help reduce reduce the risk. So, you know, a lot of us have these these garden budgets that we've been awarded and most of you probably have all the money planned out for how you're going to spend it. But I want you to think about if you have any uh, money left over, you might be able to think about how you can apply some of those funds to to some of the equipment and sort of small infrastructure you can have in your donation garden to help reduce some of these food safety risks. And then supporting training. So all of us are taking the training right now together, which is great. And this this will be archived for anyone to show this to anyone else who's not on the call or any other volunteers that we might bring on to help out with the project. So, you know, you can take what you've learned here and do training in your donation garden for new people that you're bringing on, maybe, maybe this year, maybe not this year, or maybe in the future. And if you're setting up any future donation gardens, doing some sort of training at the beginning of the year to go over all this stuff is, is really, really important okay so you know this is kind of a funny slide over here on the right a little bit analogous to kind of what we're talking about so you know not everyone's going to be uh, you know we're, we're not going to be there you know uh, to monitor what's going on at your donation garden we're really trusting that you you know set a good example for your donation garden only really you can help reduce these risks so you know one of the things that I like to think about is that if it you know, some of this is going to seem instinctual and 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 sort of logical, so that and that's probably a good indicator. So, if instinct in, instinctively, if something you're doing doesn't feel right, then you you might want to question that, and that might be something that you may need to correct or put in a preventative action for, or or ask for help. Ask myself, ask Lori, ask Sandy, ask someone else who's involved with the project if if this is an okay practice, rather than just go go ahead and doing it. You know, the way this gentleman here, you know, rather than asking for help and sit thinking if th this is going to be okay to have this sort of set up to work on his house he just went ahead and did it anyway so he he was taking a tremendous risk uh, by just going ahead and, and doing it anyway so let's go ahead and we'll we'll we'll, we'll dive in oh and then this last bit i kind of went over this already is that we we want you to set a good and consistent example. So if you develop these practices and put them in place, but then you're actually not doing these practices, then that's going to look, you know, poorly on, on your donation garden, on the project itself. And it's just going to, you know, create a situation where people are, are doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. So if you put some of these practices and policies in place, make sure that you're following them as well and, and be a, and be a good and consistent example for everyone else involved with your project. So let's dive into a little bit of, about why we're here. Um, so, I mean, you know, a lot of us have heard about uh, food safety issues, foodborne illness outbreaks, and, and part of the reason why Lori George and myself are, are working with growers at the statewide level is because, you know, produce contamination and outbreaks are, are in the news quite not, not every day or every week, but they're in there enough to get our attention. And one, one of the reasons why that is is because produce is different from most other food items that we consume. And in this example here, we're looking at uncooked uh, chicken. So, you know, most, you can get sick from eating chicken, right? But there are a lot of good processing interventions and consumer retail interventions that you put in place as, 
as a uh, as a consumer to prevent you from getting sick, right? So, you know, chicken, raw chicken is likely contaminated, yes, but there are good processing interventions, and by cooking it at your house, you're eliminating most of the microbial risks that are associated with, with eating that produce. And it's never eaten raw, or, or it shouldn't be eaten raw. So that is one of the reasons why, you know, it, it, it's a little bit different. When it comes to produce, so in, in the example of romaine lettuce on the right, it's it's probably there's a good likelihood or a low likelihood that it is actually contaminated with something that's going to get you sick but there are very weak processing interventions and at the homeowner level or consumer level unless you're doing a very good job of washing your produce and being very diligent about that there's there's you know weak interventions at that level too and there's increasing there's an increasing amount of people consuming more and more produce you know both from grocery stores and from local food sources as well and it's typically eaten raw so that's why it, it, it's different than other foods that we're normally cooking and why we need to pay particularly close attention to produce in particular um, and put some of these good agricultural practices and SOPs in place to help mitigate some of that risk so we're not going to spend a lot of time, and, and these slides aren't really meant to, to scare you or to really dive into this problem. But this just this is just a slide we use in in the in the larger uh, grower presentation where we just sort of look at you know what products, what commodities, what produce items at the national level, so commercial scale level, are, are associated with a lot of the, the foodborne illnesses and outbreaks. And you can see, you know, it actually comes from a diversity of different things. So it's not just, you know, leafy greens might be, you know, we, we've heard about, you know, E. coli contamination in spinach, or we hear about sprout contamination all the time, but it actually is, it, it's pretty diverse. It comes from a lot of different sources, so we can't really pinpoint it's one particular thing, and if we just eliminate that one particular produce, item it'll solve the problem it's really it's really from a diversity of different things so we need to we need to think about everything we might be growing in our donation garden um, as a possibility for being contaminated so in terms of how this breaks out so this is some data that looks at the the decade starting in 2000 to 2011 so this isn't quite updated updated yet but it shows you the different um, from a microbial standpoint so a biological standpoint the the, the bacteria and viruses that are affiliated with these, these outbreaks. So most of us have probably heard of salmonella or E. coli 0157, shigatoxin producing E. coli or listeria, but hepatitis A, which is a virus, is actually you know responsible for a lot of illnesses and hosp hospitalizations, and that's commonly spread from human to human. So we're going to get into that in a little bit. We know where salmonella and E. coli come from and we can reduce those risks, but it, you know, the, these outbreaks and illnesses with produce come from a lot of different things and it's not just it's not just E. coli and it's not just salmonella. So when you look at the illnesses and hospitalizations, that, that's quite a bit and um, in fact the CDC thinks that these numbers are underreported by as much as 20 percent. And you look over at the deaths, so we can talk about this for, for a second and, and, and while all those deaths are unfortunate you know I, I think you know 57 deaths over 10 years is actually in, in some ways you could see this slide as as good news because this means that for the most part commercial growers are doing a good job at reducing risk and preventing their products from getting contaminated we still could be doing better we don't want to see those 57 deaths but you know if you think about something like bacterial pneumonia or in, in as we all know this year influenza you know there's many more deaths every single year from those uh, public uh, health organisms than you know produce associated outbreaks so doing a pretty good job uh, but we can do better and that's just kind of showing you where uh, most of these uh, produce associated outbreaks come from and and in the donation garden you know so we these are some of the things you could potentially encounter. It's not to say that it's going to happen, but these are the things that we're looking to try to potentially uh, reduce if we can. So there is some good news for us donation gardeners and community gardeners and school gardeners. So Lori and I do a lot of work at the commercial level with larger farmers, and this, this does not apply to them because they're actually selling produce in, into the marketplace. But for those of us gardeners and donation gardeners, community gardeners, school gardeners who are actually just donating produce, there is some federal legislation that's been in place since the early 90s uh, that actually has some protections for gardeners. This is called the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act. This is actually public law. So it, there are some protections 
for those who, who donate produce. So it, it still doesn't mean if you knowingly were to donate a contaminated item or you were to contaminate an item yourself and, 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 and you know, actually introduce it knowingly and they could prove that, you could still be held reliable for that. But in good faith, if you donate and someone were to get sick, that it's going to protect uh, you as a gardener or as a donation gardener or community garden. And it also sets a floor of gross negligence in in the case that you know maybe you did end up getting taken to court because they wanted to try to prove that you deliberately did something it still sets a gross floor of negligence for that so there are some protections in place as uh, for donation gardens so that that'll help relieve some of this now that does not mean that you should still just not follow good food good good agricultural practices good food safety practices or have good policies in place but it, it'll help relieve some of some of the stress if you're worried about uh, food safety issues in the donation garden so in general but not explicit to the good samaritan act are, are some uh, principles that we'll go over here so one is don't donate any produce that you wouldn't buy or use for your own family so we're going to actually look at dropped produce in a little bit and what that means. But if you have rotting produce or, or something that you wouldn't eat yourself, don't, don't donate it. Don't, don't, I'm sorry, don't donate that product. You know, compost that, you know, or dispose of it in another way. So that's just a general rule that I would keep in mind. Don't donate anything that you wouldn't eat yourself. If you are using some sort of pesticide product, whether that's an herbicide, a fungicide, or whatever, organic or conventional, make sure that you're following the labels. If you haven't taken our pesticide applicators training course, that would be beneficial. Or make sure you contact an extension professional um, or, or, or someone or know how to read these labels before you were to add anything. If, if you're not sure or you think any of the product in the garden is otherwise adulterated with fresh manure, bird droppings, and we're going to get to all of that in a little bit, just get rid of it. Discard it, compost it, don't utilize it. Just don't take that unnecessary risk. You're probably going to be pulling a lot of produce that you're going to donate out of these gardens. One rotten tomato or one tomato with a little bird poop on it isn't going to make a difference for your, for your project. Okay, so now we're going to get into talking a little bit about uh, practices uh, to reduce some of these risks. And I'm emphasizing reduce risks. So it's going to be completely impossible to eliminate all risks. So we we're just going to look at some things you can do to help reduce. Okay, I see there was some maybe issue about advancing the slide. Yeah, we are on slide eight right now, so it looks like some of most of us are seeing this. And remember, if any of us are having issues, this is going to be recorded, so you can view this at the end. So we're going to jump into some practices to reduce risks. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about risk assessment and site assessment, particularly for, for growing practices and, and harvesting practices um, beforehand. Okay, so some of these things we're going to cover right now, you may not have any control over now because you already have your donation garden set up. But you can think, you can start to think about some of these things and, and put in some corrective action or some things in place that could help prevent uh, if you see any of these issues that we're about to go over. So I'm just going to go over a few right now to give you an idea of what a proper risk assessment is uh, to kind of help clarify that. And then you can go ahead and apply this to your donation garden. Okay. So really what this means is just to kind of look at what you're already doing or what you plan on doing or in looking at your site to see if there are any risks inherent with your site that are going to um, cause some issues with microbial or biological contamination. So that's a good place to start. We're going to look at a lot mainly in this presentation about microbial and biological risks, but it's also important to note that chemical and physical risks exist as well. So in terms of some of the chemical issues that you may have to deal with outside of improper use of pesticides, we could look at things like lead in the soil or lead in rainwater that you might possibly be harvesting and applying to, the, to your garden space. So we're going to cover uh, rainwater in a little bit, but and this might not apply to most of us who aren't in an urban situation, but this is just to kind of give you another example of something that you may want to think about. And in terms of lead in soil, myself and one of our new faculty members, Dr. Andrew Margna, are working on a new lead in soil screening um, a protocol for for. Uh, 
urban farmers in particular, but it would really work for everyone else. So this will actually replace uh, relatively expensive traditional lab-based lead testing. It won't replace it, but it'll be an initial screening to kind of give you an idea if, if lead in your soil is actually an issue. And we can, I can give you some more information about that later, but just to give you an idea of some, some other chemical risks that you may want to think about. So maybe stormwater management too. So maybe some of us are really close to urban, uh, you know, high, highly trafficked roads or parking lots where stormwater runoff may be an issue as well. So that's it could be something else you might you might think about. And what about maybe exhaust or other industrial pollutants? So a lot of this really more applies to urban farmers, but these are these are some things to think about because there are things like uh, brake dust and you know polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and things like that that you that could pre pre present some risk, but you know probably aren't going to be a, a huge issue. W one of the things to help alleviate uh, this with you if you're concerned about lead and so heavy metal contamination or anything like that is that most of the risk associated with that is actually from uh, direct contamination or direct what's the term I'm looking for a direct pathway so with lead in soil in particular it's really more about inhaling or breathing in lead uh, lead tainted soil or dust or consuming it on the product itself. Plants actually take up very, very little amounts of lead and some of these other hydrocarbons and other industrial chemicals. So if you're following good uh, best management practices like mulching and making sure that um, when we're consuming the products that we're actually washing the produce off, that's going to help reduce the risk with a lot of these sort of environmental chemical issues as well. But thinking about also physical things like broken glass and things like that are also um, some things to consider in terms of risks outside of microbial concerns. So in terms of uh, some other microbial concerns, um, there, let's think about some things. So this is this bottom left picture here is actually uh, an urban uh, farm in Chicago. And one of the things you might think about is where your compost piles are located, right? So here at this farm, you can see their compost piles are located, you know, f a little bit away from their growing beds. But think about where your compost piles are located. And if there's any runoff from heavy rainwater, where would that rainwater be going? Is it going to flow right into your donation garden? Do you, did you get some compost that was delivered? Or are you applying raw manure that you have stockpiled someplace and you don't have it covered and a lot of rainwater runs through it and that's going to all leach into your garden area. These are things to think about in terms of where you're, you're bringing amendments on site or where you might have uh, you know, compost bins and things like that on the site. So it may be hard for some of you to see this, but in the far background right there, that's a porter potty at the far end of this garden. And, and I know the person who manages this site actually did go through a good agricultural practices training with us. And they knew that they wanted to put their porta potty as far away from this, this garden site as possible. And they did that because what would happen if that porta potty were to tip over? And, you know, maybe you have stormwater runoff that, that brings some of the waste from uh, the porta potty into the garden space. So that, I know that's an atypical situation and is likely to not happen. But these are, these, I'm just trying to get you in the framework of how you want to assess your site for any possible risks that could happen. So here is an example of a Google image that I that I captured, and this is actually some of you may know where this is, and this is uh, Prosperity Gardens in downtown Champaign in Champaign County. And by no means is this disparaging their setup or anything like that. I'm just using this as an example of of how you could do risk assessment at a site using uh, Google Earth or Google Images. So this was just a Google a 3D Google image, Google Maps image that I that I took out of that I just simply did a screenshot and put it here to give you an example. So something that you might think about that could be an atypical situation would be a flooding situation. So you can see in the far right end of this picture, that's what that's what's known as Boneyard Creek in Champaign, for those of you familiar with, with the city of Champaign. So what were to happen if we were to get 12 inches of rain in one day and Boneyard Creek overflows and that water somehow makes it into the garden site? In this case, this garden is, is far enough away from Boneyard Creek that an atypical flooding situation probably would not occur. So, But if you're setting up a new garden site, you probably don't want to set it up right next to Boneyard Creek or a similar creek in, in wherever you're setting up your garden. So th these are the types of site assessment things you, you, you want to think about uh, when setting your garden site up. 
So the other thing to consider here, you know, this is I'm using the railroad track as an example, but this could also be like a busy highway or a busy thoroughway, or maybe there's an industrial um, uh, plant right next to your donation garden. How would, you know, pollutants from that potentially affect your garden site? And, and I'm not saying that that's what's happening here at Prosperity Garden. I'm just using this as an example for things that you can think about when assessing risk at your site. So let's talk a little bit about standard operating procedures and good agricultural practices. So this, this sounds like a fancy term and it sounds complicated, but this could be as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. So an SOP is just really, you know, step-by-step -step instructions to give someone to complete a task. So this could be done not only for food safety concerns in your garden, but for anything in your garden, you know, how you cultivate, how you're planting, you could set this up. But in the case of for food safety issues and then maybe harvesting and post-harvest, this might be very useful for yourself and for all the garden volunteers to, to make sure that they're following the practices that, that you want to implement. So when we teach growers this and we help them write food safety plans that you know are you know a whole binder full of information that is one way you could do it you could write these down the other thing you could think about doing is is putting together something i like to call a visual sop or a visual management queue so here are a couple examples on the right so you know, you don't have to do it this way, but this is just an example of a of farm in Chicago, Chicago Lights Urban Farm. And this is a kind of a visual SOP that they have for their harvesting and post-harvesting procedures. So it lists different crops. It lists which order they want the, har the crops to be harvested, which ones need to get bunched before washing, and so on and so forth. So you could think about putting together something like this for your volunteers or for your, your, your donation garden. You could laminate it, make it a sign, stick it somewhere where everyone can see it, and you can easily refer back to this so everyone knows uh, the practices that you want them to follow. So this is, I think these are really useful, and I think you know all of us could do this in some form or another for some of these other uh, gap practices that we're going to look at here in subsequent slides. Here's another great example of one. So this is, I took this uh, photo from Ben Hartman. He runs an operation called Clay Bottom Farm in Goshen, Indiana. He's written a couple of really excellent books about lean farming practices. But he has this, he has a concept that he calls the visual management cue. So this, I understand this is hard to see, but I'll try to describe this. What this picture is, is actually a picture of his washing and packing station. He calls it his lean to. And what this is, is for all of his workers to understand what that washing and packing station should look like at the end of the day. So rather than constantly micromanaging your volunteers or even maybe yourself for yourself, reminding yourself what, what, what it should look like at the end of the day when you're done harvesting your donation garden, simply take a picture of your setup and maybe have a few instructions, written instructions below that picture to remind them and then post that in the area where you're you know, uh, washing and weighing the produce for the donation garden so everyone knows what the site should look like at the end of the day. So you, know, you can, again, make this as simple or as complicated as you want, but I think these are really simple, powerful tools that even us donation gardeners can implement uh, to you know, not only to make the, the harvesting and growing more efficient, but to make sure that we're following some of our, our food safety practices that we're discussing today. So now we're going to get into the meat of it. So there's a bunch of different routes for which, for how uh, contamination is spread. And this is the slide that we use uh, for our larger farmers and to look at the different routes of possible contamination. So with our typical trainings, our certified trainings, we spend a whole day, so seven and a half hours going over each one of these modules. We're not going to spend that much time today, but we're just going to pull out a few things that are applicable to the small scale. Um, but another way you can think about these the routes for contamination, um, when I first started doing these food safety trainings years ago, uh, a gentleman named Chris Blanchard, he often had this mantra that food safety is all about keeping the poop off of the produce. And I, I think there is a lot of merit to that, but I think you also have to think about not only keeping poop, poop off the produce, maybe from your domestic or wildlife animals that might be getting into the garden, but also think about keeping sick or injured humans or dirty hands away from the produce as well, or keeping untreated soil amendments that you might be applying away from the produce unless you follow a certain set of procedures that we're going to go over, or keeping unsafe or questionable water off of the produce as well, and then also keeping produce away from 
uh, food contact surfaces that may be contaminated. So that's just kind of a simpler way of thinking about it, is trying to keep produce away from these potentially contaminated surfaces, routes, human hands, untreated soil amendments. That's another way of kind of thinking about it. And we're going to go over each one and give you some, some of the just the basic things to think about for your donation garden. So the first thing we'll talk about is proper human hygiene. So humans can be a vector for transmitting disease. Okay, so we, we mentioned hepatitis A, we mentioned norovirus, so we're probably familiar with incidents of both of these in the news, but we can also spread um, fecal contamination either from ourselves or from animals that we're dealing with to the produce as well, okay? And it really does require training. Human, proper human hygiene seems like it's a no-brainer. We all think we know how to wash our hands, but there are some nuanced things with both hand washing and a few other things that, that you might not think of. And also think about injuries. What if somebody cuts themselves when they're harvesting in the garden? What do you do in that situation? Do you have a first aid kit on hand? That might be something that you might want to have on hand in case someone cuts themselves so you can deal with the situation and they can get back to helping with the harvest. So there are some obvious things, but there are some less obvious things that you should be thinking about um, when it comes to proper human hygiene in the garden. So here are a few things we can we can think about. So we're going to look at properly washing your hands, which seems like the most logical, but it's also probably the most important part. Um, what about personal cleanliness? Okay, so yes, we're getting dirty in the garden, but where has your clothing been before you came to the donation garden to harvest? Did you were you at home and you were working in your chicken coop and you're using the same boots in the donation garden as you used in the chicken coop? Well, you probably just contaminated produce from the boots you used from going through the chicken coop. So those are just some things to think about when it comes to clothing. I'm not saying you need to completely change your clothes and necessarily always change your shoes, but that's that's something to think about. We discussed, we discussed about getting injured or someone that's ill. What I would just say is that if you have a volunteer come to the donation garden and they're obviously sick and obviously ill or injured, don't let them harvest. I mean, that may seem a little harsh, but we, you know, maybe there's something else that they can do that day rather than actually handle the produce itself because we don't want to run the risk of them contaminating the produce with norovirus or something that they may have that we don't know and then possibly getting someone else sick. How do you implement practices to reduce food safety risk while working? Okay, so we, we talked about the SOPs, but what are you going to do if you see poop on or near donation garden produce? What's the protocol? Are you going to harvest that produce and, and donate it to the food pantry? You probably shouldn't, and you should probably have a procedure in place that everyone knows not to harvest produce that has, has poop on it. So that seems obvious, but these are things that need to be communicated so everyone is on the same page. And, and and really the volunteers, coordinators, everyone involved with this, you're on the front line for all the ongoing activity at the donation garden. So if you see something, make sure you bring it to the proper person's attention and, and put in a corrective action uh, in, in place. And if this involves, you know, an, another, a fellow volunteer, you know, we want to be as respectful and tactful as we can, but it's important that we remind people that there are policies that we have in place and, and they should be following those. So we're not going to go over this in great detail, but you know this is this might be a good SOP that you have at the donation garden, so or in the bathroom that hopefully you have access to, that for proper hand washing. So I'm not going to go over this because we've all seen this before, but you can use this uh, slide as your sort of baseline for how you want people to properly wash your hands. The thing I do want to note here is there's a little, we talk about single use disposable gloves. So they can absolutely be used for harvesting, but it's not the best replacement for hand washing, but maybe you could use both, okay? So making sure you wash your hands and then put on disposable gloves after you wash your hands. And anytime you change out those gloves, you're going to wash your hands between that. It's not, a, they're not a replacement for washing hands, but they can, they can help. Hand sanitizers, on the, on, their, on the other hand, are absolutely not a replacement for proper physical hand washing under running water. It's fine to have hand sanitizers there for after you wash your hands. If you wanted to sanitize them after you wash your hands, that's fine. But they are not a replacement for actual hand washing. So when should you wash your hands? And this is a good guideline. Uh, these are some of the obvious ones. So you could use this as an SOP in your donation garden as well. But that last bullet is really is really important. I really I think any time that you think your hands have become contaminated, you should wash them. 
So, you know, there, the, the five bullets before that are obvious, but if you think you may have contaminated your hands before going back and harvesting, you should probably rewash them. So here's an example on the right of a portable hand washing station. So we've seen these at fairs and other events. Uh, and something like this may be too cost prohibitive if for your donation garden. But if you don't have access to a bathroom, if your donation garden isn't at a, an extension office or it's not someplace where you have access to a bathroom, there are things you can do. So for $35, you could put together a DIY hand washing kit like you see here and I would definitely recommend $35 isn't a lot and you can probably squeeze it into your in your budget for your donation garden putting together something like this if you don't have access to running water to wash your hands so this is just simply a, a three to five gallon uh, camping water canister with a, a paper towel bungee to the top of it paper towel holder and you can see the the soap the actual hand washing soap and then a disposal bucket below that so for thirty five dollars you can put something like this together and make sure that we're actually washing our hands and, and communicating that to everyone involved with the donation garden so let's move on to talking about soil and soil amendments and we can talk about what a soil amendment is um, and there's a lot of different definitions for it, but you can read this definition here. It could be any chemical, biological, or physical materials that you're adding to the soil to improve it, whether that's structurally, fertility-wise. Um, there's a, a Biologically, there's a number of different reasons why we use them, and, and they are great to use. But we need to keep in mind what we're actually using and if that could be a route for contaminating produce potentially. So let's think about raw manure, composted manure, other plant-based composts, green wastes. We're going to cover a couple of these. The other thing you want to think about with all of your soil amendments is when are you applying them and are they actually going to come into contact with the crops that you're harvesting? And then also maybe how did you apply them? Are you incorporating them or are you just sprinkling them on the surface themselves? So these are some of the things you might want to think about. Um, and we're going to kind of cover a couple scenarios as we, as we move through this. So obviously the highest risk soil amendments are any untreated soil amendments that you might apply to the garden space okay so here are a few examples and we're gonna really pick on manure but manure is you know raw manure is the is the number one culprit so raw manure has many benefits and if you are using raw manure for your donation garden that's absolutely fine but you need to follow some very specific practices if you're going to use raw manure. If you're going to compost it and you can confirm that it's being composted, then you can treat it like it's a treated soil amendment and you don't need to worry about when you're applying it or how you're applying it. But if you're going to try to if you're going to apply raw manure to your garden site, there are some some considerations that you need to think about. So here are just a list of other things that could be con considered un untreated uh, soil amendments. And really, uh, another thing we're going to get to when we talk about composting very briefly is that anything that you're adding to the garden that you don't feel like, feel comfortable knowing that it was treated or gone has gone through some sort of process to reduce its microbial risk or, or eliminate pathogens, then you should treat it as an, as an untreated soil amendment. That's just kind of a, a general rule of thumb. So what about non-manure based soil amendments of animal origin? So these, you might, you know, bone meal, blood meal, feather meal, uh, fish emulsions, these are pretty common amendments that we might use or maybe some of us are using in our donation gardens. These are, these are great products. They absolutely are. And for the most part, they have very, very low risks. But it, it, it could be a, a good idea to try to confirm that if you're buying a product from a commercial vendor, um, trying to confirm, if you can, that th those products have been treated in, in, in some form. They typically have. Um, and it may or may not say it on the label um, when you buy a product for your donation garden. And if you're, if you're concerned and you can't verify it, you can probably call the company or send them an email and they can send you some sort of proof of conformance or they can tell you a little bit about how the the product that you purchased from them has has been treated so you can just so that'll be just to help verify that it's 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 a, it's a low risk like it, it more than likely is so that's just something else to think about when it comes to these types of uh, sort of non manure based soil amendments but are still of animal origin so the raw manures really i mean what we're talking about really are raw untreated amendments from animal origin. 
So let's talk a little bit about, let's, let's say you do actually want to use raw manure or some other untreated, unverified, untreated soil amendment in your garden. You still can use it, right? But there are some things you should think about. And for some of us, this, it may be too late in the year for some, for some of these amendments, but these are, this is what you need to think about. So let's just use raw manure as an example. So if you're going to use raw manure, and you can and you know by the sort of cultural practices of of the of the crop that you're growing that that raw manure is not going to come in contact with the harvestable portion of the product then you really just need to have a 90 day interval so 3 months between when you added that raw manure and when you're actually going to harvest that product. So we're going to use indeterminate trellised tomatoes as an example. So you can see here in this diagram, the raw manure was added on the left at some point. In between the 90 days, the tomatoes were planted and trellised, so the tomatoes aren't going to come in contact with that raw manure. And then you know, when the end of that 90 days after you added it, applied it or up, note that it's not when you planted the tomato, it's when you applied the raw manure, then you can harvest. So if you can time this properly, then you could use raw manure as long as it doesn't come in contact with, with the product and, and apply that 90-day interval. So here's what that might look like if you don't know what an indeterminate trellis tomato looks like. This is in a in a high tunnel, so this is a bit, little bit larger scale. But you can see here these are tomatoes that um, are trellised off of the ground. And if we think about that landscape fabric as you know the place where the untreated soil amendment might be, you can see the tomatoes are not in contact with the amendment, and there's very low risk that it's going to actually touch the product that you're the produce that you're harvesting. So you can apply that 90 day interval um, and and you should be okay. So the other thing I have in this slide, and I, I referenced this earlier, is uh, dropped produce. So this doesn't have to do with, so, well, it does have to do with the soil amendments, but I think it's probably a good idea, and, and some of you may think this is a little, little much, but I think it's just a good idea to have a, a no dropped produce rule. So if you have a product like trellis tomato, so you see all these tomatoes that are on the ground in this high tunnel, I would have a policy in place where you're not bringing that those dropped items to the the donation pantry. Okay, um, if you have untrellised tomatoes, so you're not actually trellising them. I I would try to trellis them and get them off the ground. If it's something like a carrot that actually does come into contact with the soil, that's a completely different story. That's totally fine to harvest those carrots. But if it's something that normally doesn't come into contact with the ground, like, like a tomato that's trellised like this, and it drops to the ground, you have no long idea how long it's been sitting there, I, it's just a little bit of a risk, and I would just suggest not bringing that type of drop produce to the food pantry as a general rule. So what about if if your raw manure that you want to apply is going to come in contact with the harvestable portion? So let's use like radishes as an example. If that's the case, then you really should be applying a much longer interval between when you're applying that raw manure and you're going to harvest the product. So in this case, um, you apply the raw manure and then you plant radishes after that and it's only 45 days later, then that that, that wouldn't work. But if you apply the raw manure, wait a number of days, plant, and then you get to that 120 days, then you're okay to harvest the, the, the radish at that point. So these are just some things to think about if you're going to be using high-risk untreated soil amendments. I'm not, it's not to say that you shouldn't use them, but you should think about these, these intervals between application and when you're actually going to be harvesting if you're going to use that type of soil amendment. So this strawberries could be an example of that. So if you have strawberries that are in direct contact with the soil, so we'll use the landscape fabric as this example of soil, then that would be something that you would apply that 128-day interval between application and harvest. And somewhere in between that 120 days, you could plant but you still have to have that interval in play 120 days. Now that is a pretty significant period of time, okay? 120 days is four months. So this would be a situation where you'd be either applying, or if you applied raw manure last fall, and now you're starting to plant in the spring, then that would totally suffice that 120 day interval and you wouldn't have to worry about it at all. So really this is kind of just getting to the point that if you're gonna use raw manure, maybe trying to apply it in the fall is a better idea than applying it in the spring right before you're getting ready to plant. So green waste, and we can also think about this as yard waste. Definitely lower risk, but not necessarily zero risk. So 
if we're using uh, leaf or grass clippings from the city, there could be issues with that. There could be chemical hazards. There could be persistent herbicides in, uh, in, in the leaves or grass clippings. There could be glass or other plastics in there. So we need to not think of them as completely zero risk. Um, and there could be biological hazards, microbial contamination. It, the likelihood is low. But if we have any concern about it, then we should be putting all the materials, any materials we're concerned about, through a composting process before we're actually putting them into the garden. So yard waste is an example. If you're getting any pre-consumer food waste from a restaurant or a cafeteria, that could be, you know, there's... You could utilize that, but it's probably a good idea to make sure you compost it first before just applying that uh, into the garden. You know, leaves and grass clippings are a little less risky for sure, but you have to think about some of these other risks, like the chemical and physical hazards as well, uh, when thinking about adding green waste uh, to the donation garden. So composting. Okay, we're not going to go into the details of composting. I'm sure some of you are, are, are good composters. Um, but really the only way you can verify that you put any of the amendments that you want to apply uh, through a treated process is by using a, a composting method. So whether that is like an aerated static compost or turned hot composting, you know, th this is actually active hot composting. This isn't just piling material in a corner and, and doing cool composting. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actively taking the amendments that we might want to apply, mixing them together, bringing it up to temperature, and monitoring it, turning it, and, and actually doing hot composting. If you can do that, and that's what you're doing in your donation garden, that's great. Ideally, you would be keeping records and making sure that you're following the right steps, but, you know, at the commercial level, you have to keep those records and make sure you're doing that. At the donation community garden level, these are just practices that you should probably put in place. It's a good idea to compost virtually everything if you can before you apply it to the garden. So hot composting is one option, but if you're doing something like vermicomposting, you know, that is an option too. Vermicomposting isn't hot composting, and there's other treatment processes as well that we're not going to go over. Um, but but if you if you vermicompost some material, then that, that would be considered a treatment process as well. Okay, so here this is this is I really like this slide. I borrowed this from Chris Enroth, and but this is a really interesting point. Uh, for if we're hand, regardless of what we're handling, but in particular with if we're handling soil amendment materials, it might be a good idea to designate specific equipment and tools for handling those soil amendments. So I love this example because I know there are some you know gardeners who like to use five gallon buckets to apply compost, to apply fertilizers, and other amendments. So it's probably a good idea to maybe have two different buckets for two different things. So maybe you're also using the five gallon buckets for harvesting produce. Let's make sure we're not using the same bucket that we're applying soil amendments with to actually harvest produce with, unless you can verify that you're putting that bucket through a cleaning and sanitizing process before you're using it for harvesting. Maybe we have color-coded buckets or, or color-coded tools that we might use that are one is specifically for soil amendments and the other might be for harvesting. So those are some things to think about as well. You might be able to put some SOPs in place um, or visual management cues so people know you know which equipment they should be using for harvesting and which they can use for other activities in the garden so if we're storing st st the storage of amendment materials so whether it's the compost we're creating for the garden or if we have compost dropped off or if we have manure dropped off or whatever we have dropped off at the site let's make sure we're we're minimizing any runoff or leaching into the the garden area so we want to make sure we're covering our compost piles uh, maybe even building berms if it's a if we have a lot of it and runoff is an issue and we and we didn't design our garden uh, around where our compost piles are then we might you know figure out a way to prevent any of the leaching from those piles getting into the garden itself so we kind of referenced this earlier with the site assessment slide where you know we don't want to have the compost bins in a place where any of the leachate from that is going to be getting into the the garden site itself the other thing to think about oh skipped one slide i think oh no i didn't um i think we'll get to it in a second is is about keeping 
um, minimizing animal access to compost piles. So we'll, I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. So let's move on to water. And water is one of the most critical components of this in terms of a route to contamination. And, and when we talk about water at a variety of scales, there's two different types. There's production water and post-harvest water. The production water is the water we might be using to irrigate our crops or, the, or, or spray our crops if we're applying any sprays. The post-harvest water is the water we're using uh, for washing or sanitizing our, our surfaces. And, and really there's two different standards that we should be applying. It's not the, We're going to talk about water testing and it's not necessarily required for the donation gardens to do this, but we need to make sure we know the, the risks of the water that we're using as a possible contamination source. So knowing the water source and quality. So we're going to look at a slide in a second that will show you the continuum of the safest water to use versus the most risky water to use. How are you applying the water? Okay, a lot of us might have multiple ways we're applying the water. We might be using drip irrigation. We might be using overhead sprinkler irrigation. That's important because overhead irrigation, that water is always going to come in contact with the parts that we're harvesting. With drip irrigation, that might not be the case. Also think about timing of when you're watering. If you water maybe three or four days before you actually harvest, then that is an interval between which if, if there were any uh, microbial contamination issues with the water, Water, then you've applied an interval. So the sun is beating down on the product, uh, the UV rays from the sun, the environmental conditions are, you know, lowering the amount of microbial load maybe on that product. So if you're applying some sort of interval between when you water and when you harvest, that's going to re help reduce the risks as well. So water is important because water, you know, it, it can, it gets everywhere. It's the biggest control point on the farm, and if we can use the, the safest sources and use it properly, then that can really help reduce the risks of microbial contamination. So in terms of the probability of contamination, this is the slide we use for our, our larger growers, but it, I think it applies to all scales. So the absolute lowest risk and the best source that you can use if you have access to it is municipal water. So if your donation garden or community garden is using public water, municipal water that's actually treated and monitored, then the odds of that being contaminated are relatively low. So as a commercial grower, you don't even need to test that water. You can for peace of mind, but you don't need to because the local water authority is actually monitoring that for you. So groundwater is somewhere in the middle. Okay, so you know, soil does filter contaminants out, but there still is a risk that groundwater could be contaminated, but it's somewhere in the middle. So if you're using well water to irrigate your garden, that's fine, um, but it's, it, it's somewhere in the middle. The riskiest water source is surface water. So for larger growers, that's typically using streams or ponds, irrigation ponds, but for donation and community gardens, uh, there's another source of surface water that I've already alluded to. And that's rainwater collection. So I would treat, if you have rainwater collection in your garden, it's not to say you can't use it, but you should treat this as surface water because it's, it's highly likely that it is contaminated either by you know, bird droppings, other animals, maybe heavy metal issues depending on the roof materials. You cannot really verify, unless you test the water, to know that it's, it's not contaminated. So all is not lost. You can still use this water, but you should use some best practices or treat the water. So there are some sanitizers you can actually use to treat the water um, if you're going to use this. So the first sort of non-treatment practice you can use is something called the first flush. So what that means is if the, during the very first rainfall or in between a long dry period, that first flush of water that comes off the roof into the rain barrels, get rid of that water because that is going to wash away a lot of the contaminants and that's where most of the contamination is likely going to occur. So get rid of that first flush and maybe even clean your collection devices if you can between that and then all subsequent collections of rainwater, the, the microbial loads and other potential chemical loads are going to be much, much reduced. So that's one strategy that you can utilize. If you're collecting it off of a greenhouse or something like that where you might be able to control the surface, where, so prevent birds from roosting or maybe able to clean that surface, that would be another best management practice as well. And then the two last factors are the most important. One is if you're going to use rainwater, 
only use it for drip irrigation. Don't use it for overhead watering because if you're using it through drip irrigation, odds are it's not going to come into contact with the harvestable portion of the crop. Obviously, if it's for radishes or carrots, it will, but maybe you don't water your radishes and carrots with this types, type of water. But the final point is the most important, and it's never wash your produce with rainwater. Okay, Don't do it. You can use it for irrigation, but don't wash any of your produce with it, and don't use it for sanitizing or cleaning any of your contact services that we're going to talk about here in a second. So this, we're not going to go into the deep with this slide right here, but really what this is showing is that if there are some, particularly like the fruiting crops, like tomatoes, peppers, and even melons, like you see here at cantaloupe, there can be an issue if you're dunking those into, into cold water. So if the produce is warmer than the water that you might be dunking it into, and no one's saying that you actually have to wash your your fruiting crops this way. Some people do, some don't. But this is actually a, a, probably a reason why you shouldn't wash, actually get your you know, tomatoes, melons, and things like that wet, is because the water can actually move in to the crop itself through a process called infiltration. And it's, it's, it's especially risky for wounded or bruised fruit, but it can happen particularly for fruiting crops like tomatoes and melons. So with those, just make sure that you, know, you can either wipe them off down with you know, a single-use paper towel or just don't harvest or, or donate any of the produce that might be super muddy and, and super dirty or, or use other practices to prevent soil and other uh, amendments from getting on the product itself. So if you are going to get tested, there's a number of labs you can take to get to get it tested, and you can contact myself or Lori George, or there, we we can provide you with some resources if if you want to get your water tested. So it's better to get it tested quantitatively, so you know how much contamination might be in there, rather than presence or absence or qualitative testing. So you can contact us if you if you want to get your water tested. We're not saying you have to get your water tested, but if you want to, there are, we can provide you with a list of some labs that you might be able to to use. So in terms of um, wash water SOPs, if you're going to be applying sanitizers or, or doing anything for your wash water, here is, um, and actually I, I've, I've used this, I put this in the folder. So this, you can't see this on your slide set, and I know some of the slides, it's a, you can't see some of the things I'm presenting, but this one right here, I actually have this in, in the GIF folder, so you can access this, and it has a bunch of SOPs on the right-hand side about how to use it. Um, chlorine, so using there are Clorox uh, bleach formulations that you can utilize. And we're not going to go over it in detail, but make sure that you follow the labeling instructions and make sure that it's actually labeled to use for uh, your wash water for the products that you might be dunking in water or washing with water. Okay, so we could spend some time on that, but it's there's a lot of detail there. But this is this is a, an SOP form that we have in the folder, and you can use this um, if you're going to use it, as well as a few other um, SOP documents to help you uh, with your wash water. So here's a real simple wash water setup. You know, this, you don't have to follow this, but this is this is something we're actually going to do at our site for the products that we are going to wash. So, so things like you know spinach and leafy greens that would wilt really quickly if you don't dunk them in water or spray them down. Those are things you're probably going to be using water in your post harvest setup for. So you might think about having like a few you know plastic tubs or bins that you can use to actually dunk the water in. So when we talk about wash water sanitizers, we're talking about, you know, putting the water that you're putting in there, you're actually applying the sanitizer in there. And an important note with these sanitizers is that you're not actually washing the produce, you're actually preventing potential contamination from spreading to everything else. So that's just an important little note. And if you're interested in, in this, um, you know, you can, you can contact us if, if you're more interested in some of these uh, wash water sanitizers. So unintentional water contact. So this is something we we alluded to this earlier, like a flood event. So if you do have a if you're if you're nearby a stream or a body of water that actually does overflow or flood, consider and it touches the the prox, the products that you're actually going to donate. I wouldn't donate those items. I would consider those adulterated and just go ahead and get rid of them. And hopefully that doesn't happen. But in the unfortunate event that it does, then. Um, uh, 
then just consider it to be adulterated. If an irrigation emitter breaks or, or, or the crops or water is coming into contact and you didn't mean for it to come into contact with it, you know, as long as the water is safe, as long as you're using your, your municipal water, then the odds are that's not going to present a risk. That really is only a big issue if you are using surface water like your rain barrel water and that accidentally comes into contact with produce and you didn't mean, mean for it to do. Then you might consider not actually utilizing that produce. So wildlife and domestic animals. So this is one of the more controversial parts of, of the training when we do it for our larger growers is, you know, we, we can't keep all wildlife out of, out of the garden or the farm. We, we know that. But there are some things that you might be able to do uh, for in terms of exclusion and some other deterrent strategies. But the big thing with wildlife and domestic animals is it's just monitoring. It's just kind of paying attention to what's going on and seeing if there's a lot of activity and, and what you might be able to do to prevent that activity from uh, contaminating the garden. Garden. So if you can figure out things that are going on around you, if you're monitoring any sort of wildlife that have um, moved through the garden, that's an important thing to, to learn how to identify. Uh, one of the things that is important with that is, you know, being able to identify uh, scat or animal droppings. So this picture on the right, this is, these are rabbit droppings. So if you notice something like this in the garden and you can make sure everyone aware of this, then you should have a policy in place for what to do about this. If this is really close to produce or on produce, you should probably get rid of that produce. You probably should not harvest that and bring that to the donation garden. So training people how to identify some of these potential risks is, is an important strategy when it comes to monitoring wildlife. So there are, you know, different types of decoys. There's physical barriers, fencing. There's things like that. We're, we're probably going to have, you know, in our donation garden, we have an issue with people and their pets and animal droppings. So we're just going to fence off our garden so animals can't actually get into it, and we're going to prevent, prevent it that way. Relocation is an option, but make sure you talk to your master naturalist friends or your local NRCS to make sure you're not violating any state or local laws when it comes to getting rid of uh, any animals in your garden site. So I mentioned the compost bin. So one of the ways, if you have a compost bin that might be attracting animals, you can think about fen you know, enclosing that compost bin like you see here to prevent uh, rodents from actually being attracted or getting into your com the compost itself. So our furry friends, and this may seem a little harsh, but I would recommend that you keep animals, your domestic animals, out of the donation garden. Now, there is, I, someone did bring up the point that if you have a, an assistance dog, a, a medical assistance dog, that is coming into the garden, then that might be something that you have to work out some sort of policy and be very careful about because you can't, you know, probably legally prevent someone that has an, a, a, a medical assistance dog from allowing them to get in the garden. But if you just want to bring your dog into the garden just to keep you company, I, I would I would avoid that. Um, you know, they don't necessarily shed the same microbial issues that some of the other uh, wildlife or domestic animals do, but it's just a good idea to to exclude your pets from the garden if if you can. So just maybe have a general policy that we're not bringing our pets and cats in, into the donation garden. This is an example. I was at the Allen Chadwick Garden in UC, at UC Santa Cruz, and they had a bunch of cats just hanging out in their greenhouse. And I thought to myself, like, this is this is probably not a good idea to have you know cats able to get in where they might be contaminating some of the produce. So the final section we're going to go over is just looking at uh, food contact surfaces, and um, we're going to talk about a little bit about handling produce too. But the the big thing here is to think about is just try to keep things as clean as possible. Okay, so you see up at the top there, this is a, a picture of a garden I had last year. You know, I, for picture purposes, I just laid all the produce out on the ground. But let's let's try to maybe not do that. We want to try to keep the produce off of the ground once we've harvested it uh, and keep it away from potential contamination. So just you just really need to consider everything that possibly touches the produce. Okay, so any of the harvest containers, any of the tables that you might be using to sort the produce, the scales that we're all using, to collect the data for this grant, that's coming into contact with the produce, any of the equipment, our hands, any of the post-harvest water, any transport vehicles. Let's think about you know, how that could potentially be a contamination route and figure out how we can clean and maybe sanitize that every time we use it to prevent any um, cross-contamination from occurring. 
So it's really important to know that there's a difference between cleaning and sanitizing. So if you have a sorting table that you're using, make sure that you clean it off first with water and possibly soap and then sanitize it after you've cleaned it. Okay, you don't just try to sanitize it because if there's a bunch of organic material on it, it's going to reduce the effectiveness of that sanitizer. So the sanitizer, there's a number of them out there. Some of the wash water sanitizers that we looked at before can be used both for uh, food contact services and for wash water. You could use them for both. Bleach is, is a good example of that. And always use the highest quality water for this. Don't use your rainwater for washing your surfaces or your bins or any of your equipment or knives. Um, so thinking about uh, ground bins is actually, this is really why I wanted to show you this slide. Um, and preventing any sort of rodents um, from getting in, into your garden space. So here is an example of you know why we might be using a bin where we're putting the product into to prevent it from recontacting the surface again and potentially being contaminated. And this also will alleviate you know any soil additional soil from getting on the product. So it, it it muddies up your wash water in the washing and packing area. So you know using ground bins is, is an important strategy to utilize, and that just means that having you're having some sort of bin um, that you're putting the product in so it does not recontact the ground again and potentially get recontaminated is something to think about. And also maybe how we're storing our bins, we don't want to attract rodents any, any way we can. So even most of us, are, our little packing areas and weighing areas might be outdoors. That's fine, but let's just make sure we don't have a setup where we're attracting rodents and creating little hiding places for them to to have little nests and issues like that. And if we if we see anything like that, we need to deal with it immediately, make sure we clean up the mess and sanitize everything before we consider using it. So don't store bins or other harvest items in a way that might create these hiding places. This is an important note. So I've seen gardens that have, you know, sorting tables like this where they're outdoors, they're made out of wood, and they're storing all their plastic uh, harvest bins underneath of it, and it's super cluttered. I would, I would avoid a situation like this if you can. You can see they actually have an animal trap in there because they, they've created some nice little hiding places for animals to hide. Let's try to make it neat. Even if it's outdoors, let's try to make it neat and easily cleanable in a situation where you know rodents and other animals can't get in there and actually potentially contaminate some of our equipment we're using for our donation garden. Okay, so those are most of the, the sort of gap practices that I wanted to cover. I know that was a lot, um, but they're just some things to think about and policies that you're going to want to put in place. Really quickly, we're just going to close out. And I know we're running a little over on time, and if you need to go, that's fine. But remember, we're going to continue on and finish this, and it's going to be recorded, and you can refer back to this. So now we're just going to sort of talk about um, some post-harvest handling strategies. And this, this, this relates to food safety, but this also just relates to reducing the quality of, uh, reducing the, the quality of the, the produce that we're harvesting in the garden. And the, the, the point here is that you should have a plan in place. Let's not go into the, the growing season and do our very first harvest and have no plan in place for how we're actually handling the material um, and bringing it to the, do uh, to the food pantries. Let's, let's have a strategy in place before we go in so we know what we're doing. And, in, you know, w produce contains a lot of water. And as soon as you harvest it, it, it begins to, to respire and lose that water very, very quickly. Some things are lose water quicker than others. So tomatoes can be harvested and sit for a little while before they start to go down in quality. But things like greens, salad greens, kale, bunching greens like that, the moment that you harvest them, if you let those things sit out in the sun, they're going to wilt and it's not even going to be good to bring to the donation garden anymore. So let's make sure we understand that, understand how we're going to cool that product down and how we're possibly going to you know, keep that cold chain in place all the way to the food pantry if we can. Let's avoid rough and unnecessary handling. So let's try to set up a harvesting protocol where we're handling the product as, as few times as possible. Yes, we might have to go through and sort through and call out some of the, the items that we that we brought in from the donation garden, but let's try to do it in, in, a, in a somewhat soft and um, a, a, the least rough manner possible. Let's think about the harvesting containers we're using, how we're hauling the product around, what work surfaces we're using, and what tools we're using for, for harvesting. And we also want to consider how we might be removing field heat 
So washing, right, and cooling and cleaning, we've kind of referred to this already. We, we want to have these strategies in place. And then also, how are we storing the product? So most of us are probably relying on the food pantry to have a cooler or a refrigerator to maybe hold the product in before they use it or get it out to the people who need it. But this might be something we think about either for our donation garden or for the food pantry that we're working with uh, before we begin the season. So we'll, we'll cover these really quickly. So the first thing to think about, you know, having some tools on hand. So garden carts are really useful. Some of us may have them, some of us may not. We might have them budgeted for in our budgets. We may not. We might be able to build them, or they might be too cost prohibitive for some of us. But it's something to consider because even these small gardens can produce a lot of produce, and especially the fruiting crops like tomatoes, that can get really heavy. So why don't you use the oldest technology around, the wheel, and use a, use a garden cart to be able to move product from the garden to your sorting tables, to your car, uh, to bring it to the food pantry ultimately. And it's also a good way to use your ground bin set up so you can keep the, the produce from recontacting the soil. If you have your bins in a cart and you're harvesting everything into the cart, then you don't have to worry about it coming in contact with the soil again. So in terms of harvest bins, they come in all different shapes and sizes. So these are bins that we used to use at the student farm down on campus. These are stackable, insertable, and they're FDA approved for food contact, and they're easy to wash and sanitize. So most, if you, most of the hard plastics, like if so, if you're using Rubbermaid containers or what, I mean, we talked about this in in some of the the meetings earlier. You know, looking for materials that are FDA approved for food contact. Most of the high density plastics are, but you might want to look into it uh, before you choose a harvest bin to see if it's approved for food contact. It's not a huge, huge deal, but it's something that you might want to might want to consider. So they come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Here's a picture of <clears throat> harvest bins that are on a plastic dunnage rack, is what they call it. This might be a nice setup to have if you can incorporate this into your budget to keep keep your bins off the ground and prevent rodents and other things from getting into them or nesting in them or from soil from getting in on them so you don't have to rewash them. Thinking about the tools we're using for harvesting, okay? Again, there's lots of different options. You know, and if you look at Johnny Selected Seeds, you can purchase, you know, you could purchase one of each one of these knives. But rather than do that, maybe focus on one or two types of tools that you're using and figuring out how you can teach them, uh, teach people to use them and, and use the safest ones and most teachable uh, equipment that you can have. So in this case, you might choose one type of harvest knife and maybe uh, one type of pruning shear uh, that you use. Use and that's all you that's all you do and you train people how to use those specifically so let's talk about washing and packing areas I've, I've kind of referred to this already and you know we're not saying that you have to have an area like this but I, ideally you know some of the products we're gonna have to probably cool down and wash and sort so it's good to have some sort of area you know out of direct sunlight um, that you can quickly get into cold storage if you have that. And we're going to look at that in a second. So ideally, we'd all have a permanent washing and, and packing structure, but that's likely not going to happen for most of our donation gardens. But maybe having pop-up tents like you see here, or maybe like an umbrella that you put on your uh, garden cart that might actually, you know, keep the product out of out of the sun. So, you know, maybe even a simple structure like that could be a good space to get the product out of the sun so you can handle it, weigh it, and pack it before you bring it to the donation garden gardens. And here you see they have real simple dunking tanks that you could put together. Those are larger 100 gallon dunking tanks. I showed you before that there are some options for smaller dunking tanks and we'll, we'll look at some of those in a second. So if we have access to stainless steel tables, that's the best, but obviously we're not all going to have stainless steel sorting tables. But if you can get like a plastic folding table that you could easily wash and re-sanitize to sort on, that, that's better than, than doing it on the ground or in your, in your garden cart itself. So any surface that's going to contact the food, make sure that you can wash it and easily sanitize it is the critical part. Stainless steel is the best, but you know plastic surfaces are fine. If you have wood tables, you can use them, but things like wooden picnic tables are just they're just going to be hard to consistently clean and sanitize. So I would recommend you know getting some sort of plastic folding table that you can set up every time you're doing your packing and weighing um, that you can wash and sanitize before each use. So let's talk about some cold storage options. So 
you know, maybe the food pantry that we're bringing our, our products to actually have a, a large cooler. Maybe they have a walk-in cooler uh, that, where they can put the product before they, they get it out or they utilize it. Um, you know, that's great. If they do, then, then you don't have to really worry about this. But there are some options that we might be able to put in play either at the donation garden or maybe that we could uh, put at the food pantry to help keep the product cold as long as possible and increase its quality. So this is actually an example that we're going to do at our donation garden here on the left. Um, and it's a real simple DIY chest freezer conversion. So if you have a real simple chest freezer that you either have or you could purchase for a couple hundred dollars, you can couple that with this thing you see in the middle here. And this is a A419 Johnson control unit. And what this is, is you plug the chest freezer into this controller unit and that controller unit into the wall and it converts that chest freezer into a cooler. So you can set the temperature. It might be kind of hard for you to see, but you, it's set at 36 degrees. So you could set it for refrigerator style temperatures and it, can, and it converts it to a refrigerator rather than a freezer. And that way you might be able to store some of your items in there after you've harvested them or at the food pantry site to keep them cool long enough before you they go out for donation or they're actually utilized. So we're gonna do, we incorporated this into our budget for our donation garden. We'll, we'll document this and show you uh, the progress of this. So if you're interested in this, you can contact me or, or follow along on the vlog series. The other thing you could do, cool bot rooms can be created. So if you have access to an old walk-in cooler or you wanted to build a room, you can easily convert an uh, insulated room into a cooler with these cool bots. So it, it requires you to have a wall air conditioning unit and one of these cool bot devices, but you can essentially turn a room into a walk-in cooler for relatively cheap. So it costs $375 for the cool bot. Maybe you have an air conditioning unit. Obviously, you'd have to build an insulated room or have access to an old walk-in cooler to do this, but this is just an option. Um, this is maybe a little bit more than most of us are going to do, but I just wanted to show you that there are some, some other options out there as well. So we'll just run through these really quickly to, to finish off, just to show you some examples. This is a diagram on the left of a little bit fancier, simple wa DIY washing and packing area. And you might be able to use some things here um, to design a nice flow for your little washing area. So pop-up tents, temporary plastic tables, your scale. If you had a hand washing sink and a dunk tank, that would be, you know, optimal. So, you know, these are some things you might think about if you have some extra money uh, to put in to your donation garden, thinking about putting together a simple area like you see here on the left. The other thing to think about if you're going to set something like this up is how the flow of, of it. So you want to make sure that you're not, you know, stepping over other people and there's nice flow for the product to come into the area and move out. So that's something to consider as well. Here's a picture on the right of the of the student farms, uh, dunk tank area, hand hand washing sink area. So this is really obviously really nice and a little bit bigger than most people are going to utilize. But just to give you some ideas, here's that you know three tub rug plastic tub dunk tank system. This might be something that you could employ as having a series of small dunk tanks that you introduce wash water sanitizer into and, and dunk your product uh, like your leafy greens in 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 a in a bin like that. Here's another picture of, of some other washing and packing areas and different types of surfaces. So again, these are fancier, but just to kind of give you an idea of what some of these, you know, dunk tank and sorting areas might look like and how you might be able to apply something like this to your donation garden. And again, this is just a sorting table. What, when I, I mentioned a sorting table multiple times, and for you, it just could be a simple plastic table where you lay all your peppers out and sort them into your bins um, as you call them out before you bring them to the donation garden. And on the right is a simple root washing table that we had set up. So you could have some variant of this possibly. Um, the thing about this to think about is if you're using a root washing table, make sure any of that water that you're spraying your crops down with isn't recontaminating other products or recontent or, or being reintroduced into the garden itself. So to close, um, I just wanted to say, you know, it's impossible to eliminate all the risks, okay? But definitely taking the time to develop some of these practices and SOPs for your donation garden is, is definitely going to help out. And if you have these actions in place, make sure you tactfully and respectfully you know, make sure people are following them and, and, and make sure you yourself as a garden leader are following them as well. And the most important thing is really just to carefully observe 
and report any potential food safety issues that you see in, in your donation garden and report them uh, to the coordinator, the educator, or, or other volunteers to, and, and implement some sort of corrective action to, to, help, to help mitigate that situation. So, so thank you guys so much for participating. Here is my contact information right here. Um, this is my email address. You can contact if you have any questions. But again, this is going to be recorded and it's going to be archived permanently so you can refer back to any portion of this. And um, if uh, water testing recommendations, any of those wash water SOPs, you know, we can we can get that information to you if you ha if you have some questions. So so that's all I have uh, for right now. And if there are any questions that you guys have, go ahead and type them in the in the chat box right now. Or you could unmute your mic and ask them. Uh, but we have 50 people on the call still, so that might be a little chaotic. Mary asked the question, and it's a very, very good question. How often should wash water be changed? That's a, an excellent question, Mary. Um, it should be changed. There's a bunch of different ways you can you can look at this. And maybe I can go back to a slide or two to reference this. So maybe let's look at these uh, red, yellow, and green uh, tub. Uh, they call them tub rugs, I think is what the, the name of these are. So you should change the water when it, when it gets excessively dirty. Okay, so w when when is it excessively dirty? Is there a quantitative way to measure that? There actually are things you can do. There are these things called seichi disks that you could put in the bottom of these containers. So a seichi disk essentially is like a circle that has uh, part of its black and part of its white. And you could laminate something like that and put it in the bottom of one of your uh, wash tubs. And when you can no longer differentiate between the black and white in the in the plastic disk, then it's time to change the water. The other thing that you could do is, you know, that there's an SOP you could do with that, but you could also, if, if, the, if you just take a maybe a, a mason jar full of water and you pull it out and it's super dirty and, and very unclear, then it's time to change that water out. Because if you have any of these sanitizers in there, the, the dirtier that this water gets, the less effective the wash water sanitizers are from preventing cross-contamination. So if, if it gets excessively dirty, and there are ways you can quantitatively measure this, but if you just if you take a, a little sample of it in a mason, clear mason jar and you see that it's really cloudy and really dirty, then it's probably time to change the water. So, and I, we can send you, some, and actually in some of the SOPs that we have in the, in the folder, the box folder, there are a couple uh, Seichi Disk SOPs that you might be able to use. And it, and it would be a fun activity to do as well uh, with, you, with your volunteers. Uh, Sarah Ruth asks, what's the Clorox sanitizing ratio? Can the sanitizer mixture be kept in a container for a set amount of time <clears throat> so I again in the box folder we have uh, a couple documents that will go over that um, in terms of having a, a sanitizer ratio ahead of time I wouldn't recommend that because what you're doing so say you're using a properly labeled Clorox bleach for your wash water sanitizer you would just have the the pure concentrate on hand and every time you're setting up a new uh, dunk tank you would just add the right amount of the concentrated bleach to that amount of water okay so you're not you're not storing any of this you know the pre-made sanitizer on hand you're making up a fresh batch every single time and there's actually ways you can test the water to make sure that that it, it actually has the proper amount of chlorine or the parasitic acid. So you can get test strips that actually tell you how much you know chlorine concentration is in the wash water. And all of that is in the SOPs in the folder. Um, it, it, some of it can be very detailed and you know I could, we could talk about it for, for a while on here, but there are SOPs out there to, to help um, to help guide that, and, and, and really simple ones too. So it's not super complex, but just make sure that you, you have, once you have a concentration that you're adding to each one of these volumes of wash, uh, wash tubs, that you make sure that you keep track of that and, and you're repeating that every single time. Uh, Connie asked the question, how can we get a paper copy of this uh, webinar? Um, so... In terms of a paper copy, you can print this out. So Sandy uh, Mason sent out a PDF of it. The 
PDF is protected, so it can't be edited, but you should be able to print it out. And you can print it out. If you don't want to print it out one page per slide, if it's a PDF, you can just print it out in multiple slides. There's an option for that. Uh, the problem is, is you'll notice some of these animations on here interfere with some of the slides. So if there's a particular slide that you're referring to, um, I can I can send you that. Like in the case of that, the list of the wash water sanitizers that is blocked in in this in the PDF version of the presentation, that information is actually in the box folder. So you can find that chart in there. Yes, and Lori reminded us all that you should just follow labeling instructions well. So whatever product you're going to use for your wash water sanitizer, whether it's a parasitic acid or a chlorine bleach type thing, make sure that you follow the labels to a T. Let's see, and, and Sandy said also check with your local extension office. So yeah, so for any of this, you know, we're not, we're not leaving you in the dark with this. If you have any questions about this, feel free to reach out to myself or Lori or Sandy, and we can point you to the right resources to make sure that you're, you're, you're adding the uh, wash water sanitizer properly. Uh, Nancy asked the question, can we share this with outside extension groups? Yeah, I, I don't see why not. Um, it shouldn't be a problem. I mean, most of this stuff is are, are my images, and uh, nothing in here I don't think is, is really copyright. I mean, we are we are using some of the Produce Safety Alliance materials, but as long as everyone knows that those materials are just for educational purposes only and, and isn't giving you any sort of cert certification, then, then that's okay. So any other questions while, while we have everyone on the line, feel free to, to pop them in, in, the, in the chat box, and I'd be happy to ask them, answer them. Okay, if, if not, then you know, I, I want to thank everyone for, for joining us, and um, I know this might seem daunting for some of you, but I think if you can just take some of this and maybe some of the riskier things that you might identify when you assess your garden and implement some practices to help reduce risks, that, 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 that's just going to work really well for you. So um, just take it one step at a time, and um, it's, remember it's all about reducing risk, not eliminating risk, and uh, yeah, best of luck for for the, the 2018 growing season, and, and we'll be here uh, to help assist you if you have any further questions. Thank you very much, Zach. And I know I, I really appreciate you doing this now because everybody has plenty of time, hopefully, to, to get their SOPs together and um, go from there. So we all have a plan going forward. Yep. So thank you very much, Zach. Great job. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. So thanks, Sandy. I